I'd like to welcome you to um, one of the 50th anniversary events. And thank you very much for participating in a Belmas 50th anniversary event. This particular event will be for um, just over an hour, um, one hour, 15 minutes. And um, I really am excited about this. It's uh, a really interesting um, second event for Belmas. I'm delighted to have um, the uh, chair and the chair is Professor Megan um, Crawford, who is at the present moment at um, Coventry University, which is the global and the global learning center. That's where um, Professor Megan Crawford is. And my colleague who is in the background, but will pop in, in um, from different times to time is um, Rahana Shanks, who is the past chair of Belmas and presently is in Hong Kong. So it's uh, in the early hours of the morning at the moment for her. And she's, at, uh, she's the um, executive head at EFS school in Hong Kong. And in the background as well, who's put a lot of this work together is um, Richard uh, Davis, who's also doing the, the technical stuff for um, Belmas for tonight. Again, a really big welcome. I'm really excited about what's going on. I will catch up with you again later on in the evening and I will be in the background. So enjoy the event. Megan, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, Ignite session. I am going to be really harsh this evening, folks. So don't think you can wander past three minutes. I will cut you off at the knees, just so that you know. Um, I'm, I'm going to be absolutely fair to everybody on that. So uh, no special pleading or big eyes at me. It's not going to work. OK, um, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is if I pronounce your name wrongly, just tell me and we'll put it right. I'm I'm somebody who keeps getting an extra H in her name uh, since Meghan Markle joined the royal family. So it's it's nice to get your name right, I always think. So um, as, as Victoria said, this is an Ignite session. We have a variety of uh, colleagues who've joined us this evening, some of whom I know, some who I don't know. And the point of an Ignite session is to excite and ignite somebody about something. So your three minutes are to interest everyone else in your topic so that hopefully they'll either contact you afterwards or they'll go away, <coughs> excuse me, they'll go away enthused to look up that particular thing afterwards. So that's the point. That's why it's called Ignite. Um, and you are only allowed three minutes. Those of you who've done a doctorate in the past, we often have three minute thesis where you have to put the kernel of your work into three minutes. So that's the that's the challenge that we're, that we're having tonight. So as everybody hopefully um, know what's happening, what the, what the rules are, so to speak, in front of you on the screen, I've shared the, the timetable. Um, and I'm going to try and keep as close to that as I possibly can. I don't like sharing my screen. I'm useless at it. So I'll probably make a terrible mistake uh, in a minute and you'll see my holiday slides. But in the meanwhile, um, just so um, you know the rules, we are being recorded. Three minutes only. If you have a question, um, if you have a question, then uh, there are two ways of tackling that. First of all, when uh, the person has finished igniting, uh, if you have a question for clarification, post that in the chat. Otherwise, we'll have a more general plenary at the end where people can ask questions. OK, I'm going to call you in when it's your turn. And uh, that's really all I need to tell you. So, Sal, are you are you all right to um, to, you know, begin in the meanwhile? Yes, why not? And uh, I'm going to give you your, when you're ready, you have your three minutes starting now. Thank you. So these reflections are based on, on my PhD findings, but also on my practice as an educational leader, the latest of which is as Deputy Vice Chancellor um, in a modern university. I got that job eight weeks before the first lockdown. Um, I'm focusing on the role of authority of knowledge in constructing authority in academic leadership. Um, I've no space to defend my contentions, but what I'm going to tell you now is authority is not about coercion. It's not bestowed with a job title along with a computer and the desk. It's not gifted by colleagues or not wholly, and it's certainly not taken by the leader themselves. It is co-constructed um, in a community of practice. 
my PhD identified four different strands of knowledge. What I called um, disciplinary or theoretical knowledge, for example, if you're a science subject leader and you have a degree in physics, um, knowing the systems, understanding the processes and the bureaucracy. Um, professional practice, being able to walk the talk and having experience yourself. Um, and finally, knowing what was going on, which I'll come back to, and is not meant in a surveillance sense. Each of those was differently relevant for me as I landed in lockdown in a new university and tried to construct myself as an educational leader along with my colleagues. Disciplinary expertise was complicated. Academics often see education as just what we do and not a subject for serious academic study. Um, so that bit remains a work ongoing with those who see it and drawing in those who don't. It wasn't a source of authority for me. Knowing the systems, on the other hand, was urgently asked of me by my new colleagues. In lockdown, online, they needed to know the processes and they needed me to understand. I spent hours in front of a computer screen learning the structures, the structure charts and the processes so that I could take the pressure off them. But I felt the pressure. Practice knowledge was really valuable. I'd been a head of school. I'd been a course leader. I'd been a module leader. I could talk to colleagues and I had taught online as well. So I had experiences to share that enabled them to identify with me. That was really valuable as we constructed me together as a leader of education. And then finally, knowing what was going on, that wasn't in a kind of stalking or surveillance way at all. My colleagues desperately needed me to understand their world and to indicate that. They needed not to see me, but for me to see them and for me to hear them and me to understand their stories. And that was one of the most valuable ways in which I was able to become embedded as a leader in education at the University of Westminster. And now you'd have to ask my colleagues. Um, I think I'm established with some authority as a leader in education. Um, and it's not about telling people what to do. It's about co-constructing together our uncertain future. Thank you. Exactly on three minutes. I, I'm very impressed. Now, if anyone would like to ask, ask anything generally, sort of to clarify anything of Sal, please could they just pop it in the chat? We're well up to time and we're doing well. Otherwise, I will bring everybody back together at the end. So I'm going to give, um, give, give you that moment in case there's anything you want to, to type into the chat. OK, so Sal, I think you were so clear that nobody wants to ask you a clarification question. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very thank much. You very much. And for, for filling in. So, oh, there's a question here. Uh, is, is this written up in a paper, Sal? That's the question. Thank you, Philip. No, not yet. Still on the to-do list. I've written up my methodology from the PhD. That, that's written. Um, and I've got something in draft that I, I need to do more with. Um, be very happy to be poked a little bit more into writing it up. OK, that's great. We'll come back to uh, the uh, the rest, uh, perhaps at the end uh, as well. So, um, Rebecca, welcome. Are you are you sat on sound as well? I think so. Can you hear me? I can. I can hear Excellent. your delta tones. Um, and uh, yes, I, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing you speak. And uh, I hope are you OK to go now? Absolutely. Yes. OK. So as I said at the beginning, which you may have missed, I will cut you off exactly. Sal was absolutely on time, so no cutting off necessary. So you have three minutes on your research starting now. OK, thank you very much, Megan. I'd like to speak about how policyscapes present sensitive leadership issues in international schools overseas. A policyscape is a landscape of policies that have originated from different theoretical, practical uh, and pedagogical foundations. International schools may draw upon policies from a variety of countries, leaving practical implications for teachers and school leaders. My study is situated in five areas in Southeast Asia, mainland China, Macau, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. Participants include teachers and educational leaders um, who are sojourners, meaning that they do not belong to the host country and are living where they are in a prolonged temporary nature. The teachers are all Canadian trained and the leaders have been trained in either Canada, the UK or the US. If you compare where the participants are from and where they are now, one might postulate policy hurdles as well as acculturation ones based on previous theories of cultural distance. However, the two perplexing policyscapes that have emerged in my study prominently pertain to special education and student mental health and safety. 
The majority of participants reported issues with one or both of these. They are, these are policy scapes because the international schools are accredited by Western government bodies in Canada and the UK, and thus are mandated by those policies, but they encounter strong regional cultural pushback on how special education and mental health are dealt with, which contrasts with the school's local policies. The first has to do with how to support students with probable exceptionalities. Testing is not endorsed. Spec ed policies existed in some, but not all schools. And even where they did exist, they were soft, often trumped by <coughs> local cultural norms. And the other has to do with students with mental health and safety concerns. This concern was reported by participants across all regions. School policies came with risks. For instance, one school principal noted that while the host country has a duty to report abuse or neglect law, it is not as clear or as strong as the one in Canada. And so if a student's safety is an issue, handling the issue with a self-righteous manner can quickly lead to the parents withdrawing their child from the school. So the policy itself may backfire. And then how can the teachers and school leaders advocate for the child's safety at this point? And so the leadership implications in international schools uh, are presented with a cluster of challenges, such as how will schools develop and articulate policies that can actually work regarding student advocacy, support for students with special needs, and the protection of students at risk of harm or self-harm. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. That, uh, that's really, um, really fascinating. Um, again, uh, you know, that a lot we could discuss about that particular one, but are, are there any um, clarifications or key questions people would like to ask Rebecca, who I was fortunate enough to meet at a conference in Canada while we could still go to Canada? <laughs> back in the day so that's great any 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 questions I think it uh, Rahana will find that interesting because um she works in an international school uh at the moment so that's good so I'm just going to pause a moment while it gives people a chance to type okay that we have a question can you can you see it Rebecca it's, so it's, I'm actually not uh, familiar with the term uh, SEN or SEN. Okay, uh, special educational needs. Ah, okay. Yes, um, they do, uh, and in varying degrees. But um, there's it. It conflicts with uh, the cultural need for um, saving face and having a, a particular uh, stance of strength. And so, what? teachers have found is they will recommend testing. Testing sometimes happens, it sometimes doesn't. Uh, there, there's so many avenues where the process can get halted and then the student is not, um, the student is not supported. I encountered this myself when I was an international teacher and uh, a student was um, tested and, and found to be on the spectrum and also in the 20th percentile uh, intellectually, and the parent's response was just kick them in the butt and make them work harder. If you have any slides you'd like to share, or even a piece of work, then we can we can share that around with the recording afterwards. Um, I hope that helps. Um, any other questions about that? Thanks, Christian, for that uh, very useful question. Rebecca, thank you very, very much um, for for putting that together, and I'm sure it's something we might return to at the at the end of the, of the discussion. Okay, so we've had two really interesting things to ignite your interest. I hope you're already feeling that you want to go out and find out more about this. Um, I think there's a really interesting article and email, Rebecca, you might have come across about looking forward and looking backward in international schools by Dan Keller. I probably put that in your way. Um, but we move on because we're going to keep to time and we've got Claire Harley. Lovely. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Claire Harley. I'm an EdD student at the University of Nottingham and I'm also very proud to be a head of history at um, Orchard Mead Academy, which is a secondary state school in Leicester. Um, today I'm going to be um, talking about what I've entitled Middle Leadership in the Time of Covid, exploring three key reflections that I think that have fundamentally changed the role of middle leader within the current context. So firstly, new technology. Secondly, um, space for professional development and coaching. 
and thirdly uh, the changing nature and importance of communication so firstly new technology um, with the current climate everything is changing so quickly and so I think that it would be fair to say that there is no such thing as experience in middle leadership at the moment so this is my third school in which I've been a head of department and yet the pace at which we're moving and the expectations of, of middle leaders at the moment is totally and completely unprecedented and so the need for resilience and adaptability is more important now than ever. Um, one of the things that we found has has been quite a refreshing opportunity, however, is the um, the ability to start with the key principles of what we think a good lesson or what an, a, 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 an effective assessment is and build on what is possible from that using um, using current technology such as Zoom or Teams to develop what we think an online lesson should look like. Um, in turn, this has led to um, opportunities for teacher leadership. So um, the head of department is now not necessarily the most knowledgeable person in terms of being able to make decisions. And it's a wonderful opportunity to praise members of the department who are more, <laughs> uh, more afraid with technology than maybe I am. Um, this is also a, a wonderful personal opportunity for me because I'm about to go off on my maternity leave. And my second in department is very, very, very um, experienced using Teams. And it's been a wonderful opportunity in which he can demonstrate his leadership um, whilst we make that transition. Um, also, the way that we've been marking assessments has surprisingly had a really, really positive impact on workload. And so being able to mark things on time with rubrics is something that we will now take forward into a post-COVID school because of the positive impact having online systems of marking has had on our uh, members of staff. Uh, secondly, professional development and coaching. Um, the first lockdown provided a space for subject CPD that was something we'd never had before. We had hours of time that we could spend together um, whilst we were working out how to um, appropriately uh, teach our children remotely. And I think it was actually some of the best CPD we've ever had and the best discussions a department we've ever had. Um, I've written a blog for Belmas about the impact it's had on us as, as a collective department. Um, coaching is a really important part of my role at the moment. We have an NQT and an RQT in our department. And I believe that many of the elements that are important to coaching, um, such as contracting and clear communication, are still possible um, in, in a remote capacity however it does miss that certain element of of body language however really strangely i think note taking is easier um Stop. in terms of oh, oh, your three thing? minutes yeah, yep your three oh, minutes is that oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that yeah that's all right i think i think i think i'm, I'm really fascinated by the positive side of covid which i haven't actually heard that much about so um, that was really useful but you, you'll probably be able to get the other point in at the end claire so don't, <laughs> don't worry so about it <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, uh, hopefully people can see the questions, but I'm going to read them anyway. As a head of department, what was one way that you found effective to communicate, collaborate with and support your teachers? And that's James from Malta. That's a really interesting question, and I would have got onto the answer to that, so I apologise for talking too much. Um, I think that one of the things that is fundamentally a disaster is the increased communication through email, and so I think that physically being able to see one another through Teams or a format like this has been the key thing that has kept a, a culture within our department. Um, my notes for that bit says stress, stress plus home learning plus more email communication equals disaster. And I think that that's, if we can avoid that if possible, I think that's key. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Noreen asks, as this situation is new for both heads and SLT, has the relationship between SLT and middle leaders changed in your view? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think if, I think that firstly, I think senior leaders in schools are doing a, a absolutely amazing job at the moment coping with very very quick changes I think that it would be fair to argue that leaders senior leadership in schools at the moment have to be very reactionary and so I think there might be a little bit more of a directive stance with middle leaders however I think that if you have a positive um, school culture like we do we understand the situation and and maybe there isn't as much time to rationalize decision making but if you have faith in in your in your leaders or your school you you're okay with that if that makes sense <laughs> yeah so it's probably a, a, bit, a bit about trust really and and the, and the relationships that, that have already existed in a in a in an organization yeah that's really good thank you very much I'm going to uh, say no more questions at this point but again we'll have time at the end I hope to uh, return if you've thought of anything in the meanwhile so um okay I'm going to move on to Zubaya is that how you say your name I hope it's yes. right 
It's Zubia. Zubia. Excellent. Excellent. Zubia, I'm, as you saw with Claire, I'm vicious. I will, I will cut you off. Um, but I no hope you get, <laughs> I hope you'll be able to to give us some really interesting um, ignite ideas in three minutes starting now. Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Zubia. I'm a doctoral student at University College London under the supervision of Professor P Peter Early. Um, today, I would like to introduce um, the concept of VUCA. Uh, a VUCA leadership landscape. VUCA, for those who aren't familiar, is an acronym which um, um, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, which I'm sure you'll all feel sums up the COVID-19 crisis that we're all facing as school leaders. I'd like to basically touch on each one and talk about some of the challenges that we're facing as a result of that factor and then maybe some ways that we can look at to tackle that challenge. Um, so the first one is volatility. Of course, that's turbulent times, uh, questions like what's going on? Do we know what's going on? And um, one of the ways that I feel that we can face that challenge is to focus on our core business uh, as school leaders and our core values and in the face of rapidly paced change, really keep that shared sense of purpose. And as the previous speaker said, you know, relational trust is so important to keep that positive vibe. The second area, um, uncertainty, of course, is a lack of predictability in, in what's happening. Questions like, when will this end? Will this end? Um, uh, what now? Um, so in the face of that challenge, we it, it's about understanding so making sense of current impacts and processing a range of perspectives, a range of stakeholder perspectives and building a, a, an understanding of now and looking ahead to kind of this week, next week and next month rather than next year. The next factor is complexity. Um, we're having complex variables, competing demands, questions like how can we overcome this? Um, with complexity, we can face this with clarity. So prioritizing our um, actions, using a networking based thinking. So using our SLTs and our teams to bounce ideas off and you use the um, thinking from that um, to communicate to stakeholders clearly about what need, what's happening and being honest about if you don't have the answers. Um, the last area of a VUCA landscape is unprecedented, you know, the ambiguity part. So we're in unprecedented times. Questions like, how do I know if I'm leading well? So the uh, that would cover basically the way to face that, in, in my opinion, is adaptability and agility. So connecting with new knowledge as quick as we can and making sense of that, actioning new ideas, which maybe we wouldn't have um, taken the plunge to do. And actively inviting feedback from our teams to see from everybody at all the stakeholders to see how how it how it, how we're doing and using that as a as like a like a, a cyclical way of no of improvement as an improvement cycle so overall as i say vuca is um an acronym to help us make sense of what we're oh. what we're very good you just about got there yeah i got there <laughs> congratulations <laughs> No, thank you very much. Um, I like a good acronym. There's all, it's, it's always useful to have a, a good acronym. So um, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Has anyone got a, a question that they'd like to ask about, about that? Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of um, roadmaps, which the Prime Minister seems fixated with, which I suspect will play into that thing. So I'll just again, I'll just take a little pause while it gives people a chance to type something if they wish to do so. Okay, so we've got one. So does a VUCA landscape make the notion of strategy obsolete? I wouldn't say so. I would say it's more of a, a framework for making sense of how you come together to form strategy and maybe making that uh, time frame for the strategy a little bit shorter, but not necessarily making it obsolete. It's more a kind of like a, a way to... Um, consider the various phases or various aspects or the climatic feel of, of of what we're facing and compartmentalizing that for better understanding is how I would think of it. Thank you that, that's a, a really good question and an excellent answer as well so um, any more questions at this point? Uh, 
Uh, oh, right. We have got another question for you. Um, how do you, uh, Christian, Christian wants to know how you monitor the impact of uh, VUCA. Nice question. Um, so in the part where I mentioned about ambiguity, the way to overcome ambiguity is to access your teams and collaborate and, and build something called learning agility. So learning agility is, is an ability to learn and, you, and take on new information from a range of sources. So that means being more receptive to, to, new, to new, um, new information that comes in. So the monitoring part is, I think, from the feedback that you get from everyone in your organization and being receptive to that and then taking decisions based on that feedback. Because of the fast pace of change, I think that's the best way to, to, to react if that's, the, that's where, where the question is heading. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's great. Okay, that's good. Um, so we've, we've had some, some really stimulating paperwork and always the frustration, uh, the frustration of this format is that you want to do more and you want to get into it, but it is, it is there to excite you. It's a bit like the old Forrest Gump box of chocolates, you know, you pull different things out and, and go in different places. Now, our next um, igniter is Sarah Mullen, who tells me uh, that um, she's going to keep her camera off due to um, three children. Which that's sounds right. <laughs> which, which sounds very interesting and I know that all of us will have been in the last year will have met our colleagues cats grandmothers children <laughs> postmen and, and all sorts of people in the background uh, so don't worry about it at all Sarah thank you so much and thank you everybody it ties in with what my presentation is about this this evening and I'm Sarah Mullin I'm a deputy head teacher I'm also a very proud mum of three and I'm doing my doctorate in education very much inspired by the research of Victoria, Megan, Kay Fuller, amongst many others. Um, I'm researching the underrepresentation of women in secondary school headship positions in England. And this has been widely reported in the media. Now, according to the most recent data uh, provided by the Department for Education, gender equality still exists in the leadership of secondary schools, despite this workforce um, in secondary schools being dominated by women. So we have a workforce of 63% women, and yet just 38% of women head teachers um, are in positions at the moment. So despite many years of equality legislation and gender and leadership research, we still have underrepresentation uh, under in the gender of, of women leaders. And women are still experiencing gender related uh, discrimination as well, which Victoria refers to in her, preview, in, in her research. So there's clearly a disconnect between policy research and practice. Now, in my ED research, I'm doing a mixed method empirical study, which aims to explore the extent to which gender influences how women head teachers of secondary schools in England perceive themselves in terms of their identity, and the extent to which they perceive that their gender has impacted on their career aspirations and their experiences as well. Now, through my research, I really want to explore the identities that women head teachers inhabit and the ways in which women position themselves and are positioned as head teachers. But my concern is that the impact of a global pandemic may have exasperated this long-standing problem. Has COVID-19 um, you know, negatively impacted women head teachers and women who would be aspiring to become head teachers perhaps? Just like myself here this evening with three little ones beside me, is it any more looking like an appealing career? Trying to engage with my participants over the course of my ED would certainly suggest that there has been an issue. I think, um, you know, having to uh, the relentless workload, staffing issues, safeguarding issues, and um, government U-turns on examinations, lateral flow testing, track and trace over our Christmas holidays, 11th hour emails being received on a Friday evening when we should be spending time with our loved ones, really is making the job of a head teacher challenging. It's making it um, less desirable, really, for the people that would be moving into those roles in the, in the years ahead. This is something that I'm really very much looking forward to exploring as part of my EDD. Um, and could it be that these issues that, that head teachers are facing will result in a max ex exodus of our existing head teachers, or could it put off aspiring women to the role? Um, recent research by the Teacher Wellbeing Ed Index um, from Education Support shows that an overwhelming eight and nine percent of head teachers are reporting feeling stressed or very stressed since schools reopened back in September. And in addition, 59% of school leaders revealed that they're thinking of um, leaving the profession this year. 
So okay, you know, sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Thank you. <laughs> you you did you did a grand job, um, but I'm st- I'm going to be I keep telling you I'm going to be vicious. So I hope that's not too um, unkind of me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is this is fascinating, um, Sarah, because it is. It, I mean, I did a, a master's in the 1980s, 1989, I think it was, or 1990, and, and I studied gender and women he- in with with um, uh, Valerie's work uh, in that area and. So many things have changed, but so many things have not changed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So um, uh, we, we've got a, uh, some questions, I think. And the question is, how can I, as a governor, help women climb up this career ladder? Good question. Well, a lot of the work, and I think Victoria's in a lot of this and Kay Fuller as well, I think having positive role models. So, um, you know, we always use the word um, Adelman, you can't be what you can't see. So having women that other women can aspire to be like who represent them is really important and um, coaching models is great and perhaps growing leaders within the school as well and um, so um, providing opportunities for leadership I think really importantly as well in the advertisements for head teachers in a lot of on the tears or in e-teaching things some of the language that's being used seems to be very much geared towards somebody who's going to dedicate their whole life to the job that's going to be committed that's going to drive all this change and a lot of the characteristics that are required or desired perhaps might be off-putting to, to potential women. Okay, yeah, and potential men as well, I think. When I when I see some of the job descriptions that are out there, uh, you know, the super person, um, I think I, from my point of view, I think we need to think very carefully about what we're asking for, um, yeah. you know, in terms of it. And it's interesting what you say about COVID exacerbating some things in, in ways but perhaps I haven't thought about. Um, you know, going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're bang on time. I've only cut off slightly. I hope people were near the end. And I'm moving on to Noreen. Hello, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi, Megan. Hi, Noreen. I'm going to start. If you're ready, I'm going to start you now. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'll be speaking about governance leadership. The purpose of governance is to provide confident leadership. Board members are strategic, non-executive leaders of the organization, and they have three core functions, ensuring clarity of vision, ethos, and strategic direction, holding school leaders to account, and ensuring the financial health of the organization. As strategic leaders, board members uh, bring about school improvement indirectly. Being custodians of the vision and finances, they ensure that the resources are allocated to best achieve strategic goals. Through their monitoring and by in-depth questioning of data, they help drive school improvement. And finally, they provide support to executive leaders. Board members understand that the members of the school management are operational leaders. Effective governance ensures that creating the vision and strategy is a collaborative effort between the strategic leaders on the board and the operational leaders of the organization who will create the operational plan. A good relationship between non-executive and executive leaders is essential. The board is often described as a critical friend and the relationship as one of challenge and support. Professor Chris James and colleagues argue that these terms are unhelpful as they give the impression of the board being critical and confrontational. They suggest that the work of the board is best described as one of scrutiny. Board members have a crucial role to play in community engagement. The arrival of maths on the educational scene has brought governance challenges. Some communities feel a sense of disconnect with the trust board and there is perceived lack of legitimacy with this governance model. In my view, leadership at the local level should be retained. Every school or a small local cluster of schools should have a local governing body with this membership consisting of people who have strong links with the local community and an interest in their school. The board leadership is the accountable leadership of the organization. The current educational system is one of high stakes accountability. The board faces uh, accountability pressures itself from central government, from local authorities, from the community, et cetera. Effective boards ensure that they hold the executive leaders to account in a way that doesn't lead to fear in the organization, but instead is a way of determining what isn't working and then putting it right. Finally, governors also play an important role in system leadership by serving as national leaders of governance. 
So this was a quick account about educational leadership by governors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, 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 well within the 10 seconds, that was very good. Thank you. I, there's so much I'd like to ask as a, as a, as a MAT chair and as, also as a governor, but I'm going to keep my mouth completely closed. Um, yes, and Carol Shakeshaft, uh, we've gone back to gender. That's right. That's great. But have you, any questions about governance at the moment? Um, that would be great. I know there are some of you uh, in the participants list who uh, know a lot about governance. So uh, I shall, I, again, I shall pause. Uh, uh, okay, the, Noreen, a question is, is to you is, in what areas do you think research in governance is lacking? All areas. I think governance isn't, uh, isn't uh, researched as well as it should be. And if any of you are looking to take up an AD or an MA, I'd, I'd strongly advise you to look at governance as, as your topic. Um, we really do need more research, especially with, like Meg, uh, Megan said, uh, with the new maths coming up, there is hardly any research about how maths function, what is best practice out there. So I, I, all areas of governance re need research. Thank you. Yeah, and it's true. I mean, there, there is research into maths, but the governance aspect is probably less research than executive headship and, and CEOs and all that sort of side of it. Uh, Victoria's asked a question, which I, I don't know if Noreen will have at her fingertips, so she might not be able to answer it. What are the percentage of black governors in education? Do you know? Um, I should have known, but uh, it's very low. Um, we, the majority are, are white, and especially if you look at... Um, governors of an uh, older age, they are mostly white, about more than 90% of older governors are white. The younger governors are more from ethnic backgrounds, uh, still not, not as much as we would like to. Um, so there's a NGA, etc. are doing a lot of um, push on this to get everybody on board. And um, if any of you would like to join the governors or, or know somebody who wants to, please encourage them because uh, it's, it's a fa fabulous thing to do and we need diversity on boards in order to represent uh, everybody uh, who comes to our schools for education. Yes, and I think there's been an ongoing discussion about diversity in all its aspects, Fem women, you know, yeah, yeah you, you, women with children and all that sort of thing. We could go down there, but we, we, I'm going to have to stop it there. There's a couple more questions, but I'm going to try and come back to them at the end because um, I want to keep the, uh, to keep the momentum. So um, we, we really w worked our way around the education system and a bit of the world as well. And um, I think we now come back to you, Beth, Beth, don't we? Are you there? Yes, yes she yes. is. Um, good to hear from you. And I feel that as I know you quite well, I can cut you off like that. So, so you, have three, you have three minutes starting now. 15 years ago, I was a head of department knowing little about leadership. If it were not for an informed head, that might have continued. But I was nudged to the wonders of study, which led to a master's, which introduced me to Belmas, which led to a doctorate. I had discovered, without wishing to sound too Disney, a whole new world. For me, Belmas is all about connecting people. But first, let me talk about the disconnect that Belmas seeks to address. Disconnect continues between schools and universities. We have practitioners who feel that they can do research on their own with no need for academic formality. Just this week, I was invited to a teaching recruitment event for university students and I heard a great head teacher say that they could research in schools without having to be connected to a university at all. Dip your toe into educational Twitter and you will see academics trolled and chastised by other educationalists for not knowing what life is like in schools. This week, there was actually an argument as to who was to blame for the continuation of learning styles, universities or schools. I mean, really. Sometimes we have teachers with no experience of carrying out research academically, but then again, we also have academics with incredible careers researching school leadership without having spent any time at the chalk face. I believe that Belmas has been working for 50 years to address that disconnect. Why is connection so important to me? Well, I sometimes feel that now my role is in a place of educational no man's land. As an ex-teacher training teachers, I encounter practitioners keen to dismiss my teacher identity. And dare I say it, there are also the academics who do not regard me as one of their own. When I was encouraged to attend a Belmas conference, I was terrified. I had been teaching for years, but this was unknown territory. Would I be accepted? Would anyone speak to me? Fortunately, I connected to some lovely Belmas souls who accepted me even into a quiz team. 
Belmas has allowed me to hear about the experience of practitioners in places such as Iraq, China, South Africa, India, America, Hong Kong, and of course, Scotland. I have had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with academics and practitioners now for years. Disconnect might continue. There might still be some practitioners who do not think I'm a proper teacher, and they're probably still academics with their tightly connected circles who do not think I'm a proper academic. Shame on you. Despite this, I believe Belmas means connection. Mm -hmm. Lastly, at the start, I was introduced to Fulham, so it seems apt to finish with him. He said, in this digital age, we have never been so connected, and yet in terms of our feelings, we have never been so fragmented. And now it is no surprise that people are feeling that fragmentation more than ever. Belmas has and is continuing to connect. Please look outside of your circles to terrified waif and strays like myself and continue to be a force for connection in this disconnected world. Happy 50th, Belmas. Thank you very much and exactly on my buzzer. So that was uh, incredibly well timed. Thanks. Oh, well, so this is a, this is about connection and about Belmas. And I know, again, looking down the list, I can see people who I know are, uh, have been involved with Belmas for a very long time and some who are newer. So um, anyone have anything uh, to, to ask Beth or to say to her, of course, you're not a proper academic or whatever it is you'd like, you'd like to say to her. <laughs> Yeah, but this whole issue of identity is one that I think is 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 struggled with um, on you know all over the place, and I know Belmas discusses it quite a lot. So I'm I'm going to give again have a little pause. Um, some Ian appreciates your contribution. That's great. <laughs> ah. They're just so stunned. <laughs> right, here we are. Um, Claire asks, um, what do you think is the cause of the almost anti-academic mood in some schools or from some teachers? I think a lot of teachers don't like being told what to do. They get it so much in terms of uh, the political agenda that actually what they think is that is just another set of people who are busy kind of telling them what to do without actually knowing and feeling their experience. And so I think that's what happens is that they they do feel disconnected uh, in, the, in that way. Um, and it's almost, there is a kind of, um, there is a sort of anti sort of intellectualism as well that goes around. I know that personally, when I was thinking about headships and sadly, it, decided against that, um, but I was advised that, um, for example, that um, I should take off my application letters that I wanted to do a doctorate, which I did at that time. And they actually, somebody actually said to me, it's a shame really you couldn't replace it with some stuff about children, but you haven't got any. <laughs> Oh, dearie, dearie me. I, it always makes you think, you know. OK, there's a couple more questions. I think we've got time for, for, for one. Um, Rebecca asks about how is connectivity cultivated without pushback on work and overload? Um, well, I have to say I, I am ridiculously biased because I just think it really, you know, the teachers should be encouraged to do masters, for example, just as, as, a, as a kind of baseline. And so I do a lot, obviously I look after about 600 PGCE students every year. And uh, of those, I encourage a lot of them to go on and do my master's program. And I have about over a hundred people doing that each year. Um, and that's separate to the, the MED program that we run. So I think, I think it's to encourage them to really understand about synthesis. Obviously, most PGC programs are now level seven anyway. So they should be, we spent a lot of time via Kolb, um, encouraging them to integrate and understand the relationship between theory and practice. I love, I love that quote, the fallacy of the theoryless practice. And that's what we kind of share with them. Thank you very much. And I, I'm sure that, that, sorry, there's a couple of other questions, but I'm going, keeping to time. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back in a minute, uh, uh, that those of you, Steve and, and Peter, who've asked questions, because I want to keep Jo, um, uh, I want to keep, give her her opportunity in terms of time. Are, are, you, are, you, are you ready, Jo? I am, thank you. Okay, so you have three minutes and it, that starts now. I'm a practitioner researcher. And in my role as a strategic business leader at a large special needs school, these are the challenges facing educational leadership today in my context. The need to be agile 
our operating environment is having to change daily in response to government requirements, and we need an organisation that can respond quickly and effectively to meet those requirements. The need to be resilient, to be able to deal not only with how we as leaders are personally feeling about COVID and its threat to our families and lifestyles, but to also be resilient enough to keep facing new challenges every day and being able to lead in an increasingly VUCA world. Thanks to Zubia for saving me to have to explain that. The need to be innovative, curious and creative. The pandemic has demanded that we embrace new ways of working, remote, segregated, at very short notice. In order to make this work for our context, educational leaders need to think differently and to come up with different solutions for situations that no one has ever experienced before. The ability and willingness to embrace new solutions. Everyone working in schools has had to quickly familiarise themselves on how to use IT to best effect in order to continue working, both on the teaching and support side of schools. This has led to resistance from many followers, but also leaders who feel that they don't have the necessary skills to change the way they work and don't want to accept that this is what the future holds for them. The ability to enthuse those they lead. More than ever before, leaders need to inspire their followers, many of whom have moved from their comfort zone to their fear zone. It's the job of leaders to move followers into the learning zone and then the growth zone, to be proactive rather than reactive. Otherwise, we'll lose another year of productivity to this pandemic. The ability to implement new methods of performance management. With the necessity of employees having to work from home where possible, having to homeschool, look after sick family members or self-isolate, performance management can no longer be based on the working nine to five model. Performance management needs to change to a target based model where it's not how many hours you put in, but have you achieved the targets. So how are leaders handling these challenges? Well, the need to be agile by forming collaborative alliances with other settings so that you can all share information and solutions and also to support each other. Obviously by using teams, remote working, increasing skill sets to, to cover for other people's jobs when people are off. Um, and then moving on to the need to be resilient. Make sure you know what boosts your own resilience and other relevant, offer relevant options to other leaders and teachers. Share inspirational documents with each other. Form WhatsApp groups, virtual staff rooms, online quizzes, anything to, to keep people's momentum and, um, and I'm sorry, I keep going. <laughs> um, and the ability and willingness to embrace new solutions, to use the pandemic as an opportunity to learn what needs to change. Some things you probably needed to change anyway, but you never had the impetus. Well, now you have. Form mini working groups across different roles to deal with discrete projects, e.g. how to set up your COVID testing centre in school, in order to harness different ideas, perceptions and solutions. And time's up. <laughs> but I just finished one sentence. Of course is, you can. Finally, the pandemic is providing us with opportunities for leadership development on speed. Let's embrace the learning. Very good, very good. Yeah, I should have allowed you a little bit of latitude because you, 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 you had a little loop in the middle anyway. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep my strict persona, you know, there. So that was really interesting and um, comments of people enjoying it. Have you any questions for Joe um, during that? I, I wait to see. Don't think we, I think we may not have any, Joe. You, <laughs> we'll have to wait, wait and see. Oh, no, they're just all delighted. They thought it was really interesting. OK, well, maybe if you're thinking about it, uh, people can come back to you in a minute when we come to the plenary. So um, there are lots of connections between these presentations, which are, are in very different areas. But um, I'm, I'm just interested in the concept of resilience and flexibility. Um, OK, so uh, there's lots of questions for later coming up. So let me just check. I think it's Alan next, isn't it? Hello, Alan. Are you there? I am. Hi. Hi, um, how are you? Good. I'm good to with you all. Okay, and uh, are you ready? Can I start you off now? Yeah, good. Okay, so my name is Alan Lee, and I'm a Chief Executive of a group of schools in Bedfordshire, also a trustee of the Mindfulness in Skills project. And one of the largest challenges I think the education system faces at the present moment is the burnout well-being of head teachers, often leading to them leaving the profession. I work with a lot of head teachers, both within my trust and beyond my trust. And I've been a head teacher myself for well, 20 years next year. So um, it's something I, I've spent a lot of time with as a practitioner. I'm really grateful for Sarah for giving the figures from the wellbeing index. So I won't, I won't dwell too much on those, but there's a 
big body of evidence that shows that the levels of teacher, head teachers leaving the profession. Two aspects of this I'm particularly interested, other challenges. Firstly, the complexity of leading schools, which is increasing exponentially, um, with multiple sites, huge support services, huge numbers, huge budgets, uh, very challenging time. I think it's quite difficult to impact on some of those things. I don't think they're going anywhere particularly. But second, the second aspect, which is basically the, the, the focus of my talk, is the preparation for headship. And I think we're stuck in a, in a model which focuses on what the heads can do rather than how heads can do, can do those sort of tasks. And I think we can and we have to improve this. So how do we actually improve this? How do we get a handle on this? I think we need a greater focus on the inner lives of leaders and potential leaders and try to equip them with the tools to thrive and flourish in these particularly challenging times. So in essence, I think we need more mindful leadership and more compassionate organisations. And um, if, I'm, if I may sort of try and uh, provide an example of that, in my own group of schools, I lead the Bedfordshire Schools Trust, and we're working through developing mindful leadership and developing more compa more compassionate way of doing things. And so, so some examples of things we're doing. The first thing is kind of the example of myself and senior leaders being mindfulness practitioners and advocating mindfulness and offering a, a state of being, a, a way of approaching um, uh, what we do, I, I guess. Um, and some of those are very simple things, you know, giving people time and space, listening more carefully to people, thank you emails, all that sort of thing. Um, Underpinning that, we have bespoke training programs which are based on mindfulness practice, developing habits of mind, calmness, awareness, kindness, those type of type of things. Underneath that, we have formal mindfulness programs developed largely with the Mindfulness and Skills Project for staff and students, and that's looking at the expert experiences of, of being mindful. Um, under under that, we have a range of coaching courses. Um, so it's leadership is all about working with and through people. And we have lessons studying various um, coaching courses to empower and support people. And then with regard to performance, we have compassionate ways of looking at performance. Compassionate. And stop. <laughs> I sorry to cut you off. Each <laughs> <laughs> after each other, yes. And um, I, I, I'm thinking as you, as you were talking, I'm thinking Suzanne, who I know is in the audience, may have a question or a thought in this area, because it's it's an area I know she's interested in. Um, but we have a question for you from Alison. During COVID, are heads prioritising well-being enough? Has COVID shone a light on well-being? Uh, and, and was there enough focus previously? It's quite a big question, but do you, I guess, any part of that you wish to answer, Alan? Well, I know in, uh, Alison, she's an English background, that's why it's a long question. Um, <laughs> I think head teachers are prioritising um, well-being, that, but they're prioritising well-being for all staff. And what I think we need we need to see is more prioritising of self. And if we think about compassion, I think compassion is a flow concept, really. Um, to me, from me, from me to you, to you back to me. And we need to, I mean, from an Eastern Buddhist type perspective, they always start with self-compassion. Unless we're compassionate to ourselves, unless we're kind to ourselves, it's very difficult for us to be kind and express those sort of approaches to other people. And I think the neuroscience is beginning to catch up with that now. And there's an awful lot of research um, in, in, in this area. Um, so okay. I think that's where we're falling down a bit, really. Okay, and, and Suzanne, me pointing a finger at her, she's not actually feeling that grand, but she says she'd like to discuss it with you later, because I know she's, I can put you both in touch with each other, so that'll be good. Um, and the, the second question that came up uh, was from, uh, from Philip Woods, which is, Alan, do you think we're still focusing too much on the one leader instead of sharing across the group in, in terms of leadership development? Uh, of course, um... Formal leadership development in, in England, anyway, is based on a suite of MPQ qualifications, which move right the way through from kind of middle leadership to executive leadership now. So I think there is a ladder of leadership um, training. But for me, the big issue is it's, it's skill based and focusing on 
kind of a list of tasks. And I think we have to shift that. So if you take a, a process, an educational process like school improvement planning, we can train people do, to do a school improvement plan. And it just becomes like a long list of tasks and can then be demotivating and, and really not particularly empowering. Whereas if we sort of shift that and ta start talking about aspects that will uh, nurture individuals, will give empower them to flourish in the organisation, it's just a different approach. I think that's what we're not doing. Thank you. And we're very lucky to have Peter early with us. And, and he, he, he says there's a good new book covering many of these areas. Jackson and Barclay editors, Sustaining Depth and Meaning in School Leadership, Keeping Your Head. Um, but, and it's in the chat if, if you want. And so thank you, Peter, for that. That's great. OK, we're, we're doing quite well, I think. And we're coming to our last speaker, uh, who is a little bit worried about his connectivity. But we're, I'm sure you'll be fine. Um, uh, I'll let you say your name because otherwise I'll embarrass you by saying it incorrectly. Abdi Shakur, Tara. Abdi Shakur, welcome. But and, you, uh, Megan, you, Megan, you can call me Abdish if you want. That's what most of people call me. Okay, yes. thank you very much. That's lovely. So you, by now you know what you have to do and uh, you, yeah. have three, you have three minutes, which begins now. Right, thank you everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I think... Um, uh, I'm um, just, you know, really sharing my own experience, but also areas that um, um, the, the, the research community may actually be interested of. I'm a second year student, a doctoral student at the University of Buckingham, uh, supervised by uh, Professor James Tooley, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing research in professionalization of primary school leadership in conflict affected countries and case study Somalia, which now I'll, I'm actually uh, joining you from. Uh, my research area, particularly the interest, is doing the research on specific issues and challenges generally identified in the research conducted by the World Bank in 2018, which is looking at education in Somalia, particularly non-education sector, non-education actors, which are the key dominance in, in education sector. The context in terms of Somalia, where the conflict is still active in some parts of the country, there are no formal professional development systems which actually prepare, develop, and support school leaders. Um, if you look at that as a researcher, and I'm, I'm in conflict environment, there are a number of challenges, including safety for myself as a researcher, but also the safety for participants of my research, which are who are the teach the head teachers. And in area where there's a really still very active armed conflict, uh, challenging. The main challenge faced by the, the school leaders is not only primarily the, the safety, but also around the professional development dealing with the trauma uh, affected by, by students, uh, uh, the, the young people, the students that are actually uh, living in, in trauma, but also parents, teachers, who sometimes, as we, we talked about um, uh, absenteeism teachers and the effect it had in many developing schools in many developing countries. These are the key areas sometimes actually. It's very challenging. We know the UN data has shown that over 25, 27 million children of primary school children are in armed conflict zones, which are around 44 four countries. Specifically leading school in a conflict and a challenge, the schools that despite the risk of being uh, in danger uh, by the school leaders in, uh, themselves, they do worry about the safety of, of those part, uh, part, you know, um, teachers, but the staff and also the parents, who sometimes on the way to school may actually encounter danger, which sometimes actually could end their, their death. In terms of the unique contribution of my study so far, what did I see um, in chatting and interacting with those uh, head teachers who some of them have that experience of trauma? One of the head teachers, I do remember telling me to uh, reopen the schools during conflict and clearing the, the, you know, the, the school playground from uh, the, the dead bodies. These are the key challenges. And I think research, particularly Palmas, can actually contribute a lot and many, many happy 50th birthday. Thank you. Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you for that. And thank you for, for coming in from Somalia. It's great that you're, you that you were able to join us. Um, it resonates with me hugely because a few years ago, I had students who were working in the Sudan um, uh, as, as, and, you know, many of the things that you said really do resonate with, with me. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Christian says, um, thank you, Abdish. 
How do you keep safe as a researcher in the field of conflict zones? Um, it's, it's a quite very uh, difficult. And, and I just want to, sorry, uh, I should have actually cancelled my alarm alert, so which <laughs> actually kept me. Uh, that's why I finished on time. Um, ah. Can you repeat? Question again. Uh, yes, maybe. is it? I, I think um, Christian's asking about researcher safety in the in, when you're researching in conflict zones. How do you keep safe? Um, I, I was fortunate to have an organisation that actually hosts my my research, and, and they actually have taken my safety very very seriously by actually providing necessary sometimes escort, um, armed armed escort, to actually lead me to the school this particular area. Of, of, of conflict zones. But uh, I've also got very uh, supportive um, supervisors who actually put uh, my safety at their heart and, and actually keep in touch with them with any development. Um, I'm due to be back to the UK um, before the 15th of February because I don't want to self-isolate myself in a quarantine and hotel for 10 days and paid by myself. So I will be, I will be joining you soon in the UK. That's great. That that is really really interesting. And I think uh, you know I went, uh, when I was working at Cambridge, I had a couple of students also working in uh, difficult parts of Mexico uh, uh, and in Palestine. And uh, you know we 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 found the discussion about safety really make makes you think about the issues very deeply. So thank you for that, mm -hmm. and thank you for sharing it. That was excellent. Um, lovely. So I think we um we we're coming to the end of. Of, of the ignite bit i hope it has ignited oh we've got one uh, and uh, if you wish to answer it panelists it could be noreen but uh, it's about governors but someone else might like to answer it is the traditional role of the local school governor still relevant in the age of national multi-academy trust noreen do you want to have a first go at that okay thank you Meg. yes i think it is um i think um especially if if it's a national mat, then the trust board becomes that much removed from local schools. So there should be local governors who act as eyes and ears of the trust board in order to ensure that everything which is happening on the ground in the local individual school is, is, is working well. So yes, there's absolutely a role for local governors, uh, even in big national mats. Thank you. I, I, may, I agree that in, in my map, we have local governing bodies because we think that's really important. Shout out for my mass. I thought I'd do that quickly. Um, Beth, there's a question for you, um, uh, which is, uh, where is it here? Should teaching be an all master's profession? Well, I mean, I'm completely biased about that. So I'm going to say yes. Um, <laughs> but that's only, I mean, it is only as well, because I, I mean, it, one of the great things about sort of teaching people on master's courses is that you just remember how brilliant it is to be at the start of that experience and a whole new literature review, a whole new kind of venture that you're entering into. And it's a way into a world which otherwise you just don't hear about really. I mean, obviously I kind of integrate it into my PGCE program that, that I have here, but um, I really, I think it's, it's, Oh, a great way I found I was a deputy head when I started my master's and it just made me think in ways that I just wouldn't have done otherwise and I brought a whole new set of fresh ideas to work to the work that I was doing so um, I'm going to be biased and say yes completely yes and if everybody on the panel wants to put their, their photos camera their cameras back on feel free to do so at this point I should have said that um, that, that would be great to see you uh, as well as uh, as hear you. Um, let me just check where I am. Uh, some people are saying they're being ignited. That's good. I right. hope, hope at some point you get to be put out so you get to rest as well and be resilient. Um, so uh, we've got a question about, and this could be for anyone, that you just wave your hand at me, um, physically wave your hand because I'm no use with those pretend hands. Um, is school-based research simply a resource issue? Is it a question of time and money, Sal? Well, partly, clearly. But I think um, to kind of tie it into what I was saying earlier, it's also a matter of, of, of what knowledge is considered valuable and, and, and authoritative, really. And while people are thinking along the lines of some of the things Beth said in terms of um, the ways in which research might be valued or academics might be valued, um, then I 
think that's one of the barriers. It's, it's is this knowledge valuable in this context? What will it do for me? Um, and, and that makes a difference, I think. Yes. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a really good point. And um, I don't know if Rebecca's still with us, but I, one of the things I find when I go to Canada, actually, is that it seems to be more valued in Canada. But whether that's just me being a, a person just sk skating the surface or whether it really is more valued, Rebecca, I don't know. <laughs> She's shaking her head. So it's obviously me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not sure. It's a good question to think about, but uh, not one that I have an answer for. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not expecting any answers. So that's that's great. Um, I think we've actually tackled all the questions. Has anyone else got any burning questions that they wanted to ask? Um, yeah, Philip, you're right. Only part of the UK is in the age of multi academy trusts. In fact, it's England. Let's let, let's 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 be let's be frank about it. It's England. Um, and what I find interesting is when you compare all the different countries of the UK, but and what goes on around the world, you can learn such a lot just by comparing across and asking, well, why is that done? Um, and you know, getting an international perspective is 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 excellent. Whether that's Scotland, if you're English. Or, 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 you know, Somalia, if you're Scottish or whatever, I think getting that perspective uh, just widens your views, really. OK, so anybody wanted to ask anything else or any of the panellists want to make any final comments? Um, yeah, just, Abdish. Just thank you. It's been really great. Yeah, I think Abdish was going to say something. Did I see your hand up? Yeah, um, I just want to see really, uh, just to mention, which I never had the chance to mention in my, my um, uh, time fighting three minutes, is, um, is actually the lack of lit literature on looking at the two leadership and in conflict zone. Uh, there is a great, great actually interest in the area of the welfare and the well-being of, our, our, of, of, of those health features that I met. Um, yeah. in, we are very fortunate in the UK that we have a governing body that actually uh, have the duty of care of, of their head teachers. But I think uh, an area of, of research, particularly Belmas, might be quite very important in this area. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I think um, Tim Goddard, who is, uh, who is fat Canadian, Abdish, he's, he's done quite a bit of work in this area, so I could always put you in touch with him uh, to talk to him. So that would be great. So I uh, thank you ever so much, everyone, for, for taking part. And I'm going to hand over um, to Victoria, I think, now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Megan. I really, really appreciated that. That was a very uh, interesting and um, innovative uh, second session, really, really thought-provoking. Thought and thank you all of the uh, participants, the, pan the panels, the panel members who actually took part in that. It was uh, a whistle, whistle uh, throw through um, all of what you've said, and that was really, really um, engaging. And also the participants, thank you for the participants as well. Now, I just really wanted to say is that um, a couple of more things. One is um, that this is just, again, a start of the um, events for the 50th anniversary. This is the second one. We are um, gonna move on to the next one, which is going to be in March. I'm going to um, hand you to um, um, Rohanna in a moment, but we have um, another event, which is going to be in March. The date is going to be confirmed. And that's with Professor Cheryl Shakeshaft, who's in America. The time difference will be different. It will be um, two o'clock in the afternoon UK time and nine o'clock EST time in the morning. So we are trying to ensure that um, all the time zones are kind of considered. So it does, so this 50th anniversary and other things which we do in Belmash will be internationally um, recognized. So people don't feel that it's always at the same time, which um, we don't want to happen at all. Um, I also want to say that when uh, uh, Cheryl does hers, it's going to be um, either on or around International Women's Day. So it brings that into focus as well. Do look out for the other events. If, for example, you really felt that um, there was something you as a, a representing yourself as a leader and some people in your country would like to perhaps do something, um, please do email Belmas office. I'm the conference chair and I'm, I'm um, jointly um, doing this uh, 50th anniversary with my colleague Rahana um, as well. So we are really excited about what's going on. I'm going to hand you on to um, uh, Rahana 
and I will then come back to say thank you to the team and everything else. Okay, uh, Rahana. Thank you, Victoria. I want to say thank you to Megan again. Megan was the first person who did ignite my knowledge at Belmas uh, several years ago in Edinburgh, and that's when I first became a council member. So thank you very much, Megan, for that. I really enjoyed tonight's session too. It was very uh, well chaired. I really appreciate it. I just want to keep the, the captive audience here because we've had the same four questions running through all our events. And on Friday, we launch a talking head survey, which again is to try and collect information about what we should be doing, but also post COVID potentially to have a resource bank of information, which we can open up and use. Uh, it's, it's free participation and all these things, but also it's, um, it, it's up to you whether you want to participate or whether you want to share information as well. But it would be a very valuable resource to collect from members in the future when we're thinking of future um, events and future uh, research in the field for Belmas and where we can award our grants. Um, so if you have a connection to school leaders or educationalists that you think would be interested in answering the four Belmas questions we've used for this Ignite session and the first session, please share widely. Um, it'd be great to have as many voices heard as possible. Again, thank you so much for coming along tonight and thank you for uh, participating to everyone. Um, the events are free, keep coming along, keep sharing. I think it was a powerful conversation tonight and thank you so much for everything that Megan and Victoria and Richard in the office have done to put this together for tonight and to yourselves for putting yourselves forward for three minutes uh, of speaking really fast. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Rahana. That's really he helpful. And also, yes, Richard, thank you for Richard and his team. It's been brilliant. And also my conference team as well. I have a Tom, uh, conference group, which is brilliant. And the title, which is Looking Forward, Looking Back, which is a whole year's um, uh, uh, events is in within that title, is from a, a colleague, which is um, Stephen Courtney, which I think is watching as well. All right. Thank you. So thank you. Good night, everybody.